Hallelujah. And Lord, we thank you that you are our light, our salvation, our strength, our hope, our shield, our fortress. Lord, our high tower. Lord, you are our all in all. And Lord, we're just so blessed, so thankful that we can come and gather as the Ohana, the family of God turning our hearts and minds in worship and praise toward you. And Lord, that's why we come. That's why we're here, to worship you and to praise you in every aspect of what we do. Lord, in the songs we sing, and now, Lord, through the study of your word. So, Lord, we thank you so much. You're so good. You're so faithful. And we bless you. We love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen, amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. Uh, Last time we were together in chapter 31, we saw how God had instructed the Israelites to go and defeat the Midianites. Because it was the Midianites that caused the children of Israel to fall into idolatry and sexual immorality at the hands of Balaam back in Numbers chapter 25. And we learned a very valuable lesson from that because some of the Israelites kept back some of the Midianite women, the very women that caused them to fall into idolatry and sexual immorality in the first place. And we saw how important it is that we utterly destroy the flesh, that we make no provision for the flesh, and that we reckon the old man dead with its sinful desires, according to Romans 6.11. Well, as we come to chapter 32, the Israelites are still camped in the plains of Moab on the east side of the river Jordan, across from the city of Jericho. They have concluded their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They're now preparing to enter into the promised land. But, but, there is a problem. The problem is not everyone wants to go into the promised land. As we'll see, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they want to stay on the east side of the Jordan. They don't want to enter into the promised land. So, here in chapter 32, uh, Moses deals with this very issue. And we've divided chapter 32 into four very simple sections in dealing with these three tribes. Now, the first thing we, we want to look at involves the request to stay, the request to stay. Uh, That's in verses 1 through 5. Let's take a look. In verse 1 of Numbers 32, it says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, land on the east side of the river Jordan, they indeed... uh, that indeed the region was a place for livestock, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, Debon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elele, uh, Shebam, Nebo, and Bion, the country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel, is the land is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession, and do not take us over the Jordan. Now, the Israelites, as we've mentioned, are camped there on the eastern side of the river Jordan, across from Jericho in the plains of Moab. Uh, They're camped between the river Jabbok, which is about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, and the river Arnon, which is about the middle of the Dead Sea. They're inhabiting this entire area. Now, we're not told here in verses 1 through 5, uh, but drop down to verse 33 for just a moment. Verse 33. It says, Moses gave the children of Gad to the children of Reuben and the half 
and to half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of Amorite, and uh, the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan. Now, here we clearly see that there were three tribes involved in their request to stay. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, which of course was one of the sons of Joseph. Now, the area they were at there in the plains of Moab is somewhat of a fertile area. It's a pretty good place for livestock. It's big, it's flat, it's open, and it does get green at the certain times of the year. But it is nothing compared to the promised land. The promised land is incredibly fertile very green, very lush, and has much better climate because of its location near the Mediterranean Sea. And for those of you who've been in those areas, you understand what we're talking about. And I think this first point becomes very important because these guys did not want to enter the promised land. Now that just baffled me. Who doesn't want to enter the promised land? A land flowing with milk and honey. I find that interesting because oftentimes we like to wallow in our existing condition. We like to stay where we're at rather than moving forward, crossing over, coming into the promised land. And I think this becomes very important because these three tribes will subsequently miss out on the Lord's blessing because they didn't obey the Lord's commands. God told them to go into the promised land and here they're not going to do it. And as a result of their lack of obedience, they really miss out on a bunch of blessings. Uh, Turn over a few pages, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Just a few pages to the right. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Because I believe here in Deuteronomy chapter 28, we see a correlation between obedience and blessing. There's a, a connection, a correlation between being blessed and being obedient. Now I think this is important to understand because we don't obey to be blessed, but when we do obey, we are blessed. Clark, are you sure? I think so. Uh, Look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Deuteronomy 28, 1 it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country blessed shall be the fruit of your body the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you well you get the picture it just goes on and on and on in these first 14 verses there is clearly a connection, a correlation between God's blessing and our obedience. And I think this becomes an important point because I fear oftentimes we miss out on so much of God's blessings in our lives because we're not willing to be obedient to his commandments. John tells us in 1 John that the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome, They're not hard, they're not heavy, they're not harsh. Obedience to the Lord (laughs) is not something we work at and strive for. And oftentimes that becomes our problem. I mean, after all, does anybody desire to be obedient to the commands of God? (laughs) Okay, four of you, good. Well, the problem is we often try to obey God in our own power, our own strength. And it seems like we do pretty good in that for a while. 
But then we begin to fall terribly short. We begin to falter and fail. Why? Because we're doing it in the power of the flesh. Obedience to the Lord involves grace from the Lord. Romans 1.5 is very clear. We've been given grace and apostleship for obedience to the, to the faith. When we receive God's grace, that is the enabling empowerment to cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4.15 declares... And once we understand this principle, now all of a sudden the, the burden is off of us. The, the weight on our shoulders is now removed because it's not up to us to be obedient. Do we need to have the desire for obedience? Absolutely. We need to make a conscious decision in our own mind saying, Lord, I want to obey you, but I realize I can't obey you in my own power and in my own strength. I need help. And at that point, as we've humbly cried out to God for his help, he then gives us his grace, which enables us to be obedient. And when we are obedient to the Lord, man, the blessings just come. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says that God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we could even ask or imagine. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I can imagine a whole bunch. And God wants to bless us more than we want to be blessed. And here we see a, a tragic example of those who don't want to be blessed by not entering the promised land. Well, uh, back to Numbers chapter 32. We said there were four things we wanted to look at. We looked at uh, the request to stay. The second thing involves remembering the past. Remembering the past. In verses 6 through 15, back in Numbers 32, Moses begins to recite the past to point out the warnings for the future. Let's take a look. In verse 6, it, it says that Moses said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, and pr subsequently the half-tribe of Manasseh, shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now stop right there for a moment. Here, before Moses begins to make his point about the importance of them remembering the past so they don't make the same mistake in the future, Moses draws an interesting conclusion. He says, shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Moses thought the reason they did not want to enter the promised land is because they didn't want to go to war. They didn't want to fight. Now, as we're going to see momentarily, that is clearly not the case. So here in verse 6, before Moses gets to his point, we see he jumped to a wrong conclusion because he assumed that's what they wanted to do. You know, as I thought about that for a moment, I thought how easy it is for all of us to come to the wrong conclusion about something because we make assumptions. We make the wrong conclusion about someone or something because we assume the wrong thing. We haven't gathered all the information. We haven't brought in all the facts. Because the truth of the matter is there is two sides to every story. And this is an important lesson. Moses thought he knew exactly why they didn't want to go to the promised land. Are they going to go fight while you sit here? Hey, they had no intention of staying there. They were willing to go fight. And I think this is a great encouragement for all of us to hold our peace regarding something or someone till we have all the facts. You know, the problem we often face is we realize there's two sides of the story, their side and the right side, which, of course, is my side. <laughs> Clark, how do you know your side's the right side? Well, because if I were wrong, I'd change my mind. Amen? So, I mean, oftentimes that's how we think. That's rolling through our, our brain because we, of course, think we're always right. And since that's the case, we draw conclusions because we assume they're wrong. And we don't have the whole story. We don't have all the facts. 
This is an important lesson for all. Well, he goes on in verse 7. He says, Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over to the land which the Lord has given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. Now here he wants them to remember the past. Guys, I know you're a little young for this. But back in Numbers chapter 13, when I sent your fathers out from Kadesh Barnea into the promised land, man, they went, all 12 of those spies, but they brought back a bad report. They said, yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but there's giants in the land, descendants of Anak, and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. According to verse 9, he goes on, For when they went up to the valley of Eshkol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel. They brought back a bad report, so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So, verse 10, the Lord's anger was aroused on that day, and he swore an oath, saying, Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and above shall see the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Well, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And look, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once again leave them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all these people. So Moses is encouraging them to remember the past. Remember the mistakes their father made in going up into the valley of Eshkol and grabbing that cluster of grapes that a couple of guys had to carry. It was so big. Because they brought back that bad report which caused the children of Israel to wander for 40 years there in the wilderness. And I think in this section dealing with remembering the past, I think there's two very valid lessons for each and every one of us. Number one, that we would learn from the mistakes of others. That's the simple point here. Moses wanted these guys to learn from the mistakes of their fathers. Learn from the mistakes that other people make. Now I got to tell you, this is a great piece of advice for all of us. See what somebody else does that is a total bonehead maneuver and say, what an idiot. I'm never going to do that. I've learned my lesson through your mistake. You know, those are the easiest lessons in life to learn from the mistakes of others. I've always liked to watch others make mistakes. Because it helps me to learn what not to do. And the converse is true as well. We look at the good deeds of others. The life of others. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Follow me as I follow Christ. So I think the first lesson is that we learn our mistakes from others. But there's a second lesson and that we would learn from our own mistakes. Because the truth of the matter is we all make mistakes. Okay, that was pretty weak. Now just ask the person sitting next to you, they will clearly tell you you make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. We all mess up on a continual, regular basis. (laughs) Okay. You say, Clark, I could have got this at home. (laughs) The question is not, do we make mistakes? The question is, do we learn from our mistakes? After we fall short, after we mess up, do we learn from it? 
unlike the Israelites who went around that mountain for 40 years, you know, God finally says, okay, you've been around that mountain long enough. (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) Because every aspect of our life is really a test, if you will, to see what we're going to do after we fall short. Yes, we confess our sin. Yes, we repent of our sin. But the issue is true repentance. Because if we truly repent, we're not going to do it again. I mean, at least not purposefully and not habitually. Oh, we might trip and fall occasionally. But do we learn from our mistakes? And I think One reason we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again is because we try to rectify our mistakes. We try to correct our shortcomings in the power of the flesh. We try to correct our behavior externally. We think, okay, my problem is over here, so I'm going to drive the other way like somehow driving a different route is going to fix the problem. Follow me? We try to fix our mistakes, our problems, our sin, let's just call it what it is, by correcting our behavior. The problem is that's a work of the flesh. We need Jesus Christ to correct our heart. Now, we can't change our heart. We can change our mind, but not our heart. And once we change our mind, then Christ will change our heart. So there's a part for us to play. We have a responsibility in the sense that we need to make a conscious decision to say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, but God, I need help. It seems like we're always back to this, aren't we? The flesh versus the spirit. You say, Clark, why is that? Well, because you and I are inhabiting this body of flesh. And the flesh, Galatians 6, 17 Uh, Galatians 5, 17, excuse me, wars against the Spirit. There's a constant battle going on. So this is a struggle you and I are going to have until the day we go home to be with Jesus. Isn't that encouraging? (laughs) But the good news is we have the power and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit to help us, to empower us, Acts 1, 8 to enable us to be victorious over these areas in our lives. Now, here's the problem. Once we obtain victory in one area, the enemy is there attacking in a different area. This is going to be an ongoing battle our whole life. But that's okay. Because it really shows us our great need and our great dependency upon Jesus Christ. Because if we didn't have these constant battles, we wouldn't have the constant need for the Holy Spirit to empower us and our Lord Jesus Christ to enable us. Follow me? So in one sense, it's a bummer, but on the other sense, it is a blessing because it causes us to draw so close to the Lord, causes us to rely upon Him and to trust in Him in every way. Well, uh, back to Numbers, chapter 32. Let's come to a third matter. Here we see a requirement is given. A requirement is given. Uh, That's in verses 16 through 32. In verse 16 of Numbers 32, it says, Then they came near to him and said, This is the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and uh, the half-tribe of Manasseh coming to Moses and Eleazar the priest, they came near to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones here on the east side of the Jordan in the plains of Moab. But we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones will dwell in the fortified cities because uh, of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel, all the tribes, have received his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen to us on the eastern side of the Jordan. Well, then Moses said to them, If you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for war, 
and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then, then, afterward you may return and be blameless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But, but, if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Guys, if you don't want to possess the promised land, if you want to stay on the east side of the Jordan, fine. But you have to promise to come fight with us until the battle's over. And they all said, okay, we will, no problem. And then Moses said, but there's one thing, if you don't do it, (laughs) you've sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Two things there. Number one, By not going and fighting with the rest of the Israelites, their sin is against the Lord. I think this is an important point. Because all sin, listen carefully class, all sin is against the Lord. In fact, the definition of sin in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 is that sin is a transgression of the law. All sin is breaking God's law. God wrote the law. Now, when people sin, their sin affects our lives. Please don't misunderstand. Somebody else's sin can affect our life in a great way. I mean, (laughs) David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba affected Uriah the Hittite, her husband, to the point of death. He had him killed. Sin affects other people's lives. Make no mistake about it. But all sin is against God. David understood that in Psalm 51.4. He said, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Joseph understood it when Potiphar's wife was coming after him in Genesis 39.9. He said, how can I do this wickedness and sin against the Lord? All sin is against God. And when we grab a hold of that simple truth, now all of a sudden, when somebody sins and their sin affects our life, we're no longer mad or want to get even. It breaks our heart. And now we want to pray for them. We want to love them. We want to forgive them. Because what they did, they've not done against me. They've done against my Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't infuriate me. That crushes me. That breaks my heart. Because of what Christ has done for them. How he died on the cross. For the sins of all of us on the hill of Calvary. So the first thing, there in verse 23 is we see that all sin is against God. But notice also, he said, be sure your sin will find you out. And I think we can look at that in two ways. First of all, we're not going to get away with sin. Our sin will one day come to light. Our sin one day will be exposed. It'll be revealed. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 12, 2, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Look, we can hide our sin from our friends, even our family, for a period of time. In fact, we might do pretty good at covering up our sins. We might not leave much of a trail at all. But believe you me, one day the light will shine on it and it will come to the surface. Be sure your sin will find you out. But I think there's a second way we can look at this. And that is, we're going to be punished for sin. Our sin will find us out. In other words, payday one day. Look, if we think we're getting away with sin, and because we feel no consequences to sin, no ramification because of our sin, we're fooling ourselves. Romans 2, 6 God said that he's going to deal to each man according to his deeds. In Galatians 6, 7, we're going to reap what we sow. Look, our sins are going to, we're going to be held accountable for them one day. And we're going to experience the punishment of them. Now, here's one problem we have. One problem is, after we sin, after we fall short, we recognize it, we confess it, and we repent of it right on. That's what we should do. But the problem is we think we shouldn't feel any consequences because we've confessed and repented. 
Look, just because we've confessed, just, just because we repented, doesn't mean the consequences aren't still going to come. We're going to reap what we sow. There is a price to pay, and payday will be one day. Well, uh, this section continues in verse 24. Take a look. We said it was from verses 16 through 32. In verse 24, Moses says, Okay, build your cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep. And do what is proceeded out of your mouth. Stay here on the eastern side of the Jordan. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moses saying, Your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our livestock will be there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will cross over every man armed for war before the Lord to battle just as my Lord says. So Moses gave command uh, concerning them to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the chief fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as a possession. But if they do not cross over armed with you, They shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. In other words, they're coming with us anyway. Then the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We will cross over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan. But the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us on this side of the Jordan. So the three tribes agreed to the requirement of, that is given by Moses to come and fight until the battle is done. But what I found very interesting in this final section dealing with the requirement that is given is that three times, once in verse 25, once in verse 27, and once in verse 31, three times these three tribes they had said they would obey the Lord's commands. Did you catch that? Three times they said that. Hey, we'll do as the Lord says. We'll obey His commands. Three times. And yet, they weren't willing to obey the Lord's command to enter the promised land. I thought that was kind of interesting because these three tribes, like many today, only wanted to obey the commands of the Lord that suited them. The ones they liked. The ones that fit in with their plan, their way of thinking. And you know as well as I do, that's the case with many today. People will go from pastor to pastor until they finally hear what they want to hear. They'll go from church to church until they'll finally find a church that fits in with what they think it should be, dealing with a myriad of issues in life in general. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to dealing with a circumstance or situation and, and I've opened my Bible and read a verse and just said, oh wow, perfect verse, there you go, that solves all your problems. And their response was, well, I think I have to pray about that. <laughs> what? <laughs> you have to pray about it? Look, this is what the Bible says, just do it. You see, we like to fit God into our plan, into our box, into our way of thinking. But either we take the whole Bible or none of it, not just bits and pieces, because the totality of Scripture is breathed by God. And I think we need to do what the Bible says from cover to cover. Okay, three of you, good. (laughs) You know, a big hearty amen, hallelujah, holy grunt really would have blessed God probably at that point just to let him know you agree with what his Bible says. This is an important issue because you know as well as I do, a lot of churches get off base. They pick and choose what they choose to believe. And they simply skip over it and never talk about it or teach on it because they don't like it. They don't believe in it. It's not popular. It's not comfortable. It's convicting. And we see that quite often today. Well, number four and finally, let's wrap this up right here. The fourth thing involves receiving the land. Receiving the land. Uh, That's in verses 33 through 42. 
In verse 33, it says, So Moses gave to the children of Gad, to the children of Reuben, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, uh, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, the king of Bashan, the land with its cities within the borders, the cities of the surrounding country, all that area in the plains of Moab east of the river Jordan. And the children of Ad, uh, of Gad built Debon and Adaroth and Aroer, Atroth and Shophan, and Jazer and, well, this place, uh, Bet Nimrah and Bet Haran, fortified cities and uh, folds for sheep. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon and Elilah and Kir Jathim, Nebo and Baal Meon, their names. Uh, being changed, and Shibma, and they gave other names to the cities which they built. And the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it, and disposed, uh, dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. So Moses gave Gilead to Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt in it. Also Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and took its small towns and called them Havo, Havoth Jair. Then uh, Nobah went and took Kenath and its villages, and he called it Nobah after his own name. So the receiving of the land on the east side of the Jordan, Moses permitted them to stay on that side. He allowed them to do what they wanted to do. Now, as a result of that, there are two problems we need to note, and we'll wrap this up. The first problem in permitting them to stay on the east side of the Jordan is that it separated them from the other tribes. It separated them from their brothers and sisters, we would say. They were on their own. They were isolated. And because of that, we know uh, that they fell into great problems. They really went off the deep end, we might say. And I think for you and me, there's a, an important lesson here. Because none of us are islands. Hey, listen, we're not lone rangers as Christians. We need each other. We shouldn't separate from each other. We encourage each other. We keep each other accountable. Hebrews uh, 10.25 says, uh, we shouldn't forsake the gathering of the saints as is the custom of some. Uh, Proverbs 27.17 says, iron sharpens iron. Man, we need each other. And that's one reason why we come together as brothers and sisters, recognizing the importance of fellowship. So the first problem is they separated from the others. But the second problem is they were now in God's allowable will. God allowed them to stay on the east side. Hey, come into the promised land. Well, I don't think we want to come into the promised land. We want to stay here. Okay, fine, have it your way. If you want to stay there, stay there. Which is really a picture of God's love, by the way. God loves us so much, He gives us His permissible will. He allows us to do what we want, when we want, how we want to do it. I hate that. I would just as soon God always force me to do the right thing. Because that way I know I would be in His perfect will, not His permissible will, not His allowable will. Now there's several aspects of God's Word that deal with His perfect will. We know it's God's will we abstain from sexual immorality. It's God's will that we give thanks always. It's God's will that we, you know, there's several aspects of God's will we know. But I think for you and I, as it pertains to God's general will for our lives personally, in all the decisions we have to make practically, I think it really boils down to two things. Number one, it involves our bodies. And number two, it involves our minds. Our minds and bodies, you say, oh yes. Because in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you're all familiar with the verse. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Isn't that amazing? As we live for the Lord, as we think about the Lord, man, we're going to be in the will of the Lord. God's perfect will, God's perfect plan. And it's simply about us saying, Lord, I desire to enter into that promised land. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to stay where I'm at. Lord, I want to keep moving forward until I reach glory. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for your word. Lord, it's so rich, so practical. And Lord, we do pray that by your spirit, you would continue to help each and every one of us to be those men and women, those servants that desire to enter into the promised land. Lord, that we would not be content with where we're at spiritually, what we're doing practically. Lord, that we would keep moving forward till you bring us to where you want us to be. Lord, that we would live for you, that we would think about you, Lord, that our lives would be directed by you. That we would be in your good, pleasing, and perfect will. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today, uh, after service, the brothers and sisters, the pastors will be down front to pray with you, to pray for you. And I do pray that God would bless you, strengthen you, encourage you, lead, guide, and direct you, fill you with His Spirit, strengthen your hands, guide your feet. Man, as you just keep progressing forward, growing in His grace and in His knowledge, man, one step further toward the promised land. God bless you guys. Have a great evening in the Lord.